I thank you for the, the people that are here. I pray that you bless them. Some of them are here by, maybe they think it's an accident. Maybe they don't even realize why they're here. But Lord, you know, and you brought them here for a reason. And so I pray that the blessed Holy Spirit, Lord, will come and do what needs to be done. Visit with us today, Lord. Save, save souls. Encourage Christians. I will praise you and thank you for it. Help us now, our Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been noticing as I've been going around town lately, I've been seeing it on signs and in different places that uh, this is national, I reckon, or at least countywide cleanup week. And it's the week when uh, we try to pick up the... Uh, Crash, you know, and all this stuff, and keep. I've seen people out on the side of the road with these little diggers and sticking pieces of paper and cups and stuff, and putting it in paper bags and plastic bags. And I couldn't help. This week, the Lord's been dealing with me about this thing, and I didn't want to do really what I'm going to do this morning. The Lord's been dealing with me so strong. I've never done this. What I'm going to do this morning, but I'm going to tell you. My testimony. Lord, lay it on my heart to do it this morning. I've never done it. I never took just the entire message and used just my testimony. But the Lord, just as sure as I'm standing here, God began to move on my heart this week, and I, I tried to wiggle around and get out of it and everything else, but the Lord began to deal with my heart this cleanup week. He began to speak to me through that. Now, I'll get to that in a moment, but it'll be 12 years this coming Thursday since the Lord saved me. Twelve years ago, I can tell you the time. It was April the 19th, 1972. I can take you to the place. It was right in front of the communion table at Nebo Baptist Church. About four or five feet back there, so many people in the altar, you couldn't, you couldn't get to the altar. That's where the Lord saved me by His wonderful grace. You know, there's a lot of people come to this church and they think I've always been like I am now. They really do. So now when I see them out there, I meet them on the street, and I say, hey, how are you doing? They look at me and they say, well, you can smile, can't you? And they just think that I'm all the time, that I've always been a preacher, that I've always had short hair, that I've always had a Bible. They, they just think I'm, they just say, I can't imagine you being like some pictures we've seen of you and some things I've heard about you, and there's a lot of people in this room that knew me before the Lord saved me, and they can testify to the fact that there's some things I'm going to tell you that are true. David said here, he told what the Lord had done for him. Paul, when he'd get in front of a crowd that didn't know him, he'd stop back from his youth, and he said, my manner of life or my youth, and he'd tell that all the way up and tell what he got saved, and then tell what was going to happen to them if they didn't. And this morning the Lord began, uh, the Lord didn't deal with my heart. And I guess the first thing I remember thinking about God is in early when I was just a little kid. I owe most of this to my mother. My mother's the first person that ever influenced me toward God that I ever remember. And for that I'm, I'm forever indebted to my mom. I know that I'm saved this morning going to heaven because of my mother. And the prayers that she prayed for me, and she taught me about God when I was little. I, I'll tell you what it's like. I remember when Mom, I started saying when, when Mom was, when we were little, when, when we sat on Mom's knee, and she probably hates to even think about this. We have two sisters. I've still got two sisters. And we all crowd in on her, and she'd have an easy chair, and something we just all crowd around. I'm just bad to remember it. And we just sit on her legs and hang around her neck and everything. And she get out this Bible story book and she read us about God. And she actually knew she pictures of the of the ark, you know, and Jonah and, and the whale and the, and the Noah and all these things. And at a very early age, I guess maybe three or four, two or three years old, uh, the impression that there's a God was put on my heart. You know, that's why it's so important that little children are taken to church. That's why it's so important that we try to reach these bus kids and these kids at an early age. You know, the, the Catholics and the communists say, if I can get a kid until he's five years old, I'll have him the rest of his life. And in a lot of cases, that may be true. 
But I remember we did go to Sunday school. We went to the little Methodist church over in Cleetsville, and it's just right up on top of the hill from where we live, and we could walk to church. And I remember the church. But I, the only thing I remember about it is when they got took out and beat half to death. Now, I mean, I was talking to some kids or something one time, and they took me outside a big old hedge bush out there, and I, she flat wore me out. And that's all I remember about church. You know, there's one thing I'd like to say right here. I remember more about God and what I learned at my mother's knee than I did even in church. Which tells me this, you cannot depend on the church to necessarily give all your kids what kind of God or what about kind of God they need to know about. But the first responsibility is in the home. You're, you're not doing your job as a daddy if you're not telling your kids about God and teaching them about the Bible. You're not doing your kids a uh, job as a mother unless you tell them about God. They need to know about God more than they need expensive clothes. Yeah. They need to know about God more than they need uh, new toys. They need that. I tell you, man, those days people weren't as well off as they are now. But you take an old tire swing and swing it up in a tire, that makes just as good a swing as a hundred and fifty dollar swing you go up here and buy somewhere. And so this morning I remember that. I remember God dealing with my heart just as a little kid. And so as long as I can remember, I knew that there's a God out there somewhere. I knew that when I was a little kid. And I remember when I'd go to church, and I don't remember this part, they told me about it when I got bigger. They said that I would get up and sing. I like to shout when you sang that song a minute ago. They said that I used to get up and sing when I was little, love lifted me in church. I don't even, I don't even remember doing that. They said I was just a little bitty, and I was always bald-headed. Dad had me skint, brother. It marked me up out of the East Coast Barber Shop, and I mean, they put the razor, meow, meow, and you wouldn't have to go back so quick. And I get up on that thing, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. There it is, we stand within, sinking the rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despair and cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. That's the only gospel song I remember when I was little. And they said I used to get up and sing, and I'd sing for money. I had the devil in me even at an early age. I go up on these women's old fat women that lived up above us. They say her name, he say, I'll give you a dime. And I say, no, I don't want to sing. I say, Sam, I'll give you a quarter. And I just, you know, wait around a little bit. And I'd make all kinds of money like that. And I, I'd sing for money. And boy, I, I, I don't know what I've been doing. But, you know, deep down inside, there was a heart, a child's heart that I had faith. Boy, I believed there was a God. I really did. And I remember singing there and going to church, you know. And then uh, my daddy, he had dogs all the time. Dad said daddy's had dogs as long as he'd been living. I don't like dogs, can't stand dogs. I don't want to be around dogs. But he likes them. He's always had them. And I remember, I could tell, I thank God both for my mom and my daddy. I really do. My daddy provided for us. He worked hard for us. He walked back and forth to Cleetsfield Mill. Brother, we didn't even have a car when I was little. And made the, made the bills. There was always something on our table. We always had clothes to wear. We always had food on our table. I thank God for parents that loved me. Everything I, everything I really begged for, I, that daddy, I begged daddy to get me. He'd always get it. I mean, when I was about 40 years old, I wanted a cigarette lighter. I wanted one so bad I couldn't stand it. Of all the things in the world that I could get, I'd rather have a cigarette lighter than anything. When I was little, I don't know why I want a cigarette lighter. I have no idea. I didn't smoke, didn't know. I just want a cigarette lighter. And I begged and I begged every day, Daddy, buy me a cigarette lighter. Daddy, buy me a cigarette lighter. Sure enough, one day, he came home and got a little yellow cigarette lighter. I'm in that place and said, boy, this is mine. This is my cigarette lighter. And I learned how to turn the wick up, you know, or have you done it with them things. And I learned how to strike it. Boy, I thought that was just the toughest thing that ever was when I could do like that and make a fire come out. Well, long after that, to me and my sisters down in the basement, and we piled up a little pile of papers and some sticks. And I was going to cry out my little cigarette lighter, brother. I set that thing on fire, and there was a fire in the basement, and they smelled it upstairs. And talked, man, they like to, we like to guard on that, too. 
I don't know why you're talking about cigarette lighter right there. I woke up one morning and go. But anyway, brother, I wanted those things. And I mean, Dad and Mom always tried to get me what I needed. They really did. They weren't able for a lot of times. But I know if they had the money that bought me anything that I could have really wanted. And I'll make a long story short, I started in school when I was five years old at Clinchfield, a little, little school down here, but they're tying all the pieces now. That's why I went to the first grade, and my first grade teacher was Miss Greenleaf. Most of you, many of you, she probably taught you too, man. She, she's still alive, you know that? I've seen her one time right here at the library. She, she looked the same now as she did when I was in the first grade. And what happened when I went in school, and I hated it. I hate it. She made you eat everything on your plate. Everything. I mean, you couldn't, man, you couldn't take nothing back, brother. I was the sickest I ever been in my life. She made me, we had spinach, and she made me eat every bite of it. I ate kid, every bite of it. I got sick. I think I threw up. I can't remember. But, brother, I was, I was in bad shape. And to this day, I, to this day, I will not eat none of that junk. I mean, unless, Lord, unless the Lord makes me just about, I don't. I, I can't stand it. I can stand it greens and all that kind of stuff like that. And boy, I, I wanted hamburgers. And they gave me greens. And said, I had to eat it, boy. I mean, you, you get sick. So I didn't matter. She made you eat what was on your plate. And I remember that. Second grade, I had Miss Snotty. Most of you remember Miss Snotty. But she's not like her name. She's a, she's a pretty sweet lady. And in the middle of the First part of the second grade, we moved to Nebo. I started Nebo school in second grade, and I, I'm not going to be able to tell a lot of things, but just to make a long story short, in the second and third grade, I still knew that there was a God. Our family, we gradually quit going to church a little at a time. Mom and Shirley and my aunt kept singing in their court, uh, trio, and they go in with 50 trio, so they kept going to church and taking us. I remember going to singing when I was little. I remember when I was little, we'd go to some of those churches and have singing, and it would seem like it lasted for hours and hours, and I thought it's never going to get over with. I'd lay in the pew, and I'd stick my feet up, you know, and I'd look under the floor. I'd look back at the people's legs, and I'd look behind me, and I'd just, I'd look at the pew, and I'd take her around with this and that. And I'd be laying on my face to the pew, and just, uh, my breath, you know, just get the pew wet. I'd just lay there, and I'd wind up going to sleep, and sing, and sing, and sing. It seemed like forever, and service would finally go over with. But you know, that done me good. That put the, the fear of God in my heart. I've never seen a preacher getting mad in the Face. I've never seen them shaking hands, boy, and, and slapping them off them while they preached, and that made an impression on me. And you know the God in heaven that looked upon me, and, and one day we never want to stand before that God. And boy, I, I remember the first contact I had with sin. I was a born sinner by nature. I remember the first, it may be not, but the first contact I had with sin must have been about the second grade. First one I'm in anyway. When he's coming home on the bus, and he's older boys, about five, fifth, sixth grade boys, I was sitting with. That's where it always starts. Every young girl you see getting in trouble, there's an older girl led her into that trouble. Every time. Every time you see boys get in trouble, they're following an older boy. There's always an older boy, an older girl, to give you the stuff, to make you in trouble, to get you messed up. And boy, these older boys got me in. They said, hey, you know what this means? And they said a foreign little word. And I said, no. <laughs> now, I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know what it meant, but I knew it was something dirty. I knew it was sneaky. I knew it was underhanded. You, hey, I'll tell you how you can prove there's a God and how a man's got a conscience. You can take a little kid and tell him a four-letter word, and that kid may have never heard that word and don't even know what it means, and he won't say it in front of his mom and daddy. Just a little toddler or something. After the kid gets big enough to talk, he'll not say You know why? He, 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 something inside of him tells him, that's wrong, that's wrong. You shouldn't be doing it. So they start telling little old dirty things, and then I remember hearing little dirty stories, you know, and like, uh, I don't even remember any, I mean, you know, stuff you'd laugh about now influenced me for sin, and influenced me for bad. And I remember on Sunday, and never hardly a Sunday went by when I was little, that I didn't think about church. 
that would all, I'd wake up on Sunday morning, Jubilee, Jubilee, you're invited to the happy Jubilee. I'd hear it on TV. Every Sunday, Mom, have that Jubilee thing on. And I thought, that sounds awful. I didn't, I didn't like that church music. I couldn't stand it. I you know, quartet to get on there, they just make me sick. The way they dress, the way they look, the way they act, I said, good night. And it wasn't about 10, 30, or 11 o'clock till Tom and Jerry came on and Bullwinkle. That was the starry cartoons that wasn't very popular. They put them on Sunday morning. And I watched Bullwinkle, they got around him and uh, Tom and Jerry and, uh, and uh, them, them crows, you know, that eat all that corn and throw it over. Who is it? Heckle and Jekyll. That's, that's their... their standing right back there. And, you know, I, I, I watch those cartoons, and boy, I watch Heckle and Jekyll, I watch Bullwinkle, I watch all that stuff, and like, deep down inside of me, I know that I should be in church. I'm just a little big kid. I grew, time went on, and I got 12 years old. When I was 11 years old, one of the worst things that ever happened in the United States happened. The Beatles came. And everybody went wild. They, the school went crazy. The homes went crazy. She loves you, yeah, 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 come. And the Beatles were going to be on the Ed Solomon show. And everybody and their grandma watched it that night. Most many of you remember that. Now, you, some of you teenagers here and young, you don't remember when the Beatles first come to America. But I do. You know what happened? A craze swept the country. A fad. Oh, immediately, everybody wanted to be a Beatle. Everybody wanted to play a guitar. Everybody wanted to have a band. Everybody wanted to play drums. Everybody wanted to sing. I mean, it just, man, the whole country just went topsy-turvy. Sure enough, I was among the crowd. Some boys down below me, they got guitars. And they got bands. And there's older boys, once again. Older boys. And they got guitars, they start playing. And I go down there and listen to them, and I said, man, I'd like to have me a guitar. Everybody got guitars. So I begged daddy and begged daddy and begged and begged and begged him for a guitar. And I, I just thought I was 11 years old. And I begged for a guitar, it just seemed like and he bought, from a guy right down here, he bought me a guitar amplifier for $50. And it's a little, I mean, it was a white guitar. A little bitty amplifier, about half as big as just this speaker right here. And I sat down and I messed with that thing, and I messed with that thing, and somebody showed me the chords. And I learned C and D and G and L, you know, and I wore blisters on my fingers so I learned how to play that thing. And I played, and I played, and I played. And it wasn't long until I did get in the band. And our first band was the We Three. As for me and two other guys, I sound stupid now. Back then, boy, that was Ma, that was, that was with it, you know. And the We Three, we called out and we played at the Boy Scout dances and uh, the uh, uh, parties that they had. I don't know when they were sung, we too, too shy to say it. We said, they're going to run a hundred of them around here, right in their eyes. And we just stand there and play the guitar right there. And we'd stand there, boy, just beat them things. And I remember we played uh, Wipeout and uh, uh, that song, um, I've got all that. No, you won't think about them. Anyway, boy, I've been talking about all them old songs. And one of them just had the same old three chords, you know, C, A, minor, F, G. Same old thing, you know. And all the Hopkins in there had them same four chords. And with the exception of maybe a change once in a while, we got into that, we begin to play. It tickled us to death. Boy, we thought we were hot stuff. We got to play for a talent show. And it's over here, I believe, at East Junior High. It's a high school then. And boy, we got all over the stage, you know, we and we have one amplifier. And we had the lead guitar and the rhythm guitar coming out of the amplifier. And this guy played drums. And the guy that played drums, uh, he, he made sure he's loud, pretty loud. He beat them things just as hard as he could be. Oh, cheap drums. Sitting about that thing around, he just cried, bang, bang, crack. Just beat them, it didn't matter. It didn't matter how it sounded. The louder, the better, brother. And we, I mean, I remember seeing one time, we played in school, and this one guy, that's when the, the parents hated the Beatles, and all the kids loved them. And this woman jumped up, stuck her fingers in her ears, and went right out, you know. That was the parents' protest against the revolution called by the young people. And boy, we got on and on and on. It wasn't long. I was, I was uh, 12 years old. And I began to play bands with older boys. 
Well, we got the round pages, and then after that, the gestures. And that's one that we met on, we went down to Arthur Smith Studio and made a record. And I went down there, and it was sorry, sorry for thing you've heard. And boy, we went down, and we played at the community building dance. Up here's community building, they used to have dances on Friday night. And all the kids in town would get in there, and, and you'd pay 50 cents and get in, and 75 cents, you and your girlfriend, and you'd get in there, and we'd play for them things, and right then, right then, uh, brother, the devil began to work on me. I ain't kidding you. And one thing saved me, besides my people's prayers, that one thing saved me. And that was I was so young that it scared me. The sin that I saw scared me. I saw people drunk. I saw staggered. I played for dances over at the Marion Lake Club, which is supposed to be a nice place, you know. I saw some of our, our teachers in this town that staggered around dancing with each other each other's wife. And I was 12 years old, brother. I was 13 years old. And a guy in our family was 17 and 18. I saw them there. I saw them swapping around each other. And saw them shouldn't even drive home. Be all over the road coming around Lake Jane. When they were so intoxicated. And that scared me. That scared me. I said, it's up. I better leave that stuff alone. If it makes you act like that. I was not old enough for the sin that I was being exposed to. Now, when a young person is exposed to deep sin, he'll either do one or two things. He'll scare him and he'll back off, or to prove he's brave, he'll jump right in there and go head over and he'll be into it. Thank God, thank God this morning, the Lord somehow held me back and it scared me. Alcohol scared me, beer scared me, wine scared me. I saw him weaving all over the highway, you know, and passing up on the floor. I said, ah, I'm scared. I didn't want to bother. And I appreciate the Lord having, having uh, causing that. And in school, uh, because of this, and because of all these things, I developed a reputation of kind of being a uh, uh, stuck up. And kind of, uh, you know, people are, oh, he wouldn't speak to you. I just, I just didn't like people. I just hated everybody. And I don't want to you know, it's a, hey, hey, that's what I'm doing. And I just walked over and I kind of got this uh, thing about uh, being uh, proud, puffed up, and really, I liked that because my class could gratify all of a little bit. And I thought, boy, I might have just, I might have just, uh, get a little satisfaction out of life just by doing this and playing in bands and making money and being popular and all this stuff. And then that's when I started playing ball. And I, at the time I started playing ball, I went hog wild crazy. My sisters played basketball, and I go to basketball games, and I see them boys score. And I see all the girls, and everybody up over here go, Wah! I kept, and I thought, now I ought to be out there doing that, so they can be doing that for me. See, the plaque is at the bottom of every day. Everything you do before you get saved, old flesh is in there somewhere. These people do all these good deeds and give money to charity and all that. Don't let them fool you, being Brother, the flesh is at the bottom of that thing somewhere. They give them something out of it or they wouldn't be doing it. And so I, I went home, boy, and I put the trash can in the corner, and I bought me up a lot of socks. And so I, I, I don't join the NBA. I can't. I went around there, you know, and I was shooting in the, in the basket. And I went in there, and I thought somebody blocked the shot. Now I got in the you know, the track can fall for. And I'm in the media time. My mom would holler at me till 11 and 12 o'clock at night after they'd done it. Go, go back! Go back! I mean, they're just ringing wet with sweat, you know, me down in the final minutes of the game. I had all in my imagination. I didn't admit that to you. I bet y'all done a stuff a lot more stupid than I did if you'd admit it. I'm telling you this because the Lord wants me to this morning. I believe there's a young person in here this morning that really needs to hear what I got to say. And so, time went on. I, I didn't even play ball. And I don't know this guy. He's the guy that played drums in our band. And one night we went camping. And I went camping with some boys from the school. And these boys from the school, uh, is, I, I forgot the name of it, some wore these jackets, you know, and flag, flag kept people from getting run over with a bus. And we went back, and one of our teachers took us, and the next day we come home and I went over to his house. And he, he was uh, reached in the drawer, his shaved in socks, and reached in the drawer and pulled out a little pistol about that long. He pulled that thing out of that never had no bullets shells in it. And the day before, his daddy had got it out and shot it a couple of times. He started waving that thing around in there, and he pointed right at me, and pulled the trigger. 
And I up and you know, pushed him way out there and he said, You want me to shoot you? And I put my hand up like that and he put that gun up at me and his dad had four shells in it the, the day before. And pow! In his bedroom, he shot me, brother. And I still got a little scar right there, you can see it, and right there is where it came out the other side. And I knocked me around like this, and the bullet went up in the ceiling. And boy, I want you to know I started screaming. That hurt, you wouldn't believe how that hurt. I was walking through the house like this. His mama come out of the kitchen, saw blood, she went, ah, ah. And we got up there and hollering at the daddy, he was out more today. They put me in a car and hauled me up here to Marion General Hospital. I was 15 years old. He come that close, blow my brains out. Back again, thank God for his protection. I said, ah, 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 what the hell, I'd be in hell this morning. And I stuck my hand up there and shot through that, through the iron. Hey, I'm going to tell you folks something. You see these cowboy shows where a man, he gets shot in on the shoulder and shot over here and he rides a horse 40 miles and kills a bunch of Indians. Hey, don't believe none of that stuff. I tell you what, man, you know how tough an I am if I can ride a horse 40 miles after getting shot. I couldn't see. I ain't like stars. I, I just barely hear voices talking. And I went and sat like a blend of death up here after about 45 minutes, 40 back got to me. And finally they got me and there's some boys living here at the pool hall. I heard about it. They come right up. I believe Brother Jerry's one of them, you know? You hear Pee Wee or something, boy? They got up there pretty quick. And boy, I don't know why I was bleeding big old piles of blood all over the floor. That laid me up the first night. I never slept a week. I don't remember, during that time, I don't remember thinking about God. The world had got such a hold on my mind that I don't even remember thinking about God. I don't. From the time, matter of fact, from the time I was 13, almost until I got saved, God is just like I'm in another world. It's like the devil had me led down the trail. It's like the devil had me doing so many other things that he's hoping, that he's hoping that I just keep going until I die and went to hell. And so time went by. I got on that all right. I I done a lot of things. I remember in ball games, when we'd go get ready to go out, they'd have all of us get around in a circle. I didn't know what we was doing. And we all put our hands on the ball. And we all try to call the top of heaven, how we got you know, play like that. I didn't know a bit more who I was talking to. I knew there was a God out there, but I didn't associate him with that player. And he he didn't he wasn't listening to us no way. We jump up and cuss and run out on you to win a ball game. But I do remember one time when we was losing. And uh, we, we were behind, and I remember sitting there on the, on the beach. Not only encourage young people to do this, uh, I don't discourage them in certain cases, but I don't encourage them. I don't even say, if you're not saved, you ain't going to do you much good to do anything but get right with God. I was sitting there, and I, I looked up and I thought, God, please help us win this game. And I don't even know who it was. Uh, I just needed out yonder somewhere. It was like a far distant old man that lived in a little old country somewhere like, like there was a big wall between me and him. And I knew he was there, but I didn't know who I was talking to. And one night I was coming home from a ball game, and this one man, worked, I think he worked for the newspaper, he's an older man, he was driving the car, and he was going up Hoppy Tom, taking me home. Somebody said something about God. That's the only time I remember. And in my teenage years, somebody talking about God. Somebody said something about God, and the guy that's driving the car says, Man, there ain't no God. And boy, when he said that, cold chills went through me. My stomach turned to flint. And the best I can remember, I said, I spoke up. I thought, well, I ought to take up for him. He's a good man. You know, I... I thought, oh, I said, well, I believe they are. That's <laughs> all I said. And I felt real good because I said something for God. And yet still, I didn't know who God was. Let me say to young people here this morning, especially you that are in sports and things of that nature, stuff, all of the years I played sports, all of the years I drove cars, I, had, I dated, I, all of the time, they were still an empty spot inside of me. All the time. When I grew up, there was just something inside of me that just wasn't right. There was just something in there that just, I just, no matter what I did, no matter where I went, no matter what I got, 
It was always like a vacuum, like a hole in there. Well, I got some money on that little sh shooting deal. And when I was 18 years old, I went to the bank and got my money. During the time I graduated from school, you know, I went through the uh, junior, senior, and all that junk. All oh, that kind of time, I was never really satisfied. I was sitting watching TV for I got saved. And I'd sit there and I'd just get mad. I'd see these shows, and I knew what was going to happen at the end. I remember feeling like this, and I'd just say, I don't want him to go it's all in I mean, why are we here? What, what's the purpose of us just living and eating, going to bed, getting up, eating, drinking, graduating high school, getting a job, working, making a living, and then dying? What's the reason for all this stuff? But there's got to be a more reason than just existing. It's got to be. And I knew that, but I didn't know what it was. I knew there was more to life than what I was getting. I knew there was more than happiness than I didn't have. I knew there was some satisfaction and some peace somewhere. So I'm looking in the wrong place. After I got out of school, I thought, boy, I'll be happy now. I thought school was all my problems. I said, if I ever get out of this prison, I'll be happy. And I felt good for a while after I got out of school. And you wouldn't believe it. I hadn't been out of school six months, so that same emptiness, that same void, was there again. I bought an MG, took the top down, drove all over the place, and that thing. You said, rub it in, you hate your friend? Yes, yeah, the Bible said, in holy, I think we were full of hate, hating one another. When he go in there, Lord, I say, hey, boys, y'all want to go in there? But I'm just using them. They're just using me. There's a lot of teenagers don't want to get saved because they'll have to give up their friends. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but you ain't got none. Amen. And the sooner you find that out, the better. But you say, oh, yes, I have a good friend. They're just kidding you. As soon as they get through with you, they'll drop you like a hot potato. They don't want you. They don't need you. Just like you would them. Amen. I've seen girls as best of friends, boy, until a boy come in. They both start liking the same boy, and then they hated each other's guts. Hey, friends. Hey, friends. All oh, the friends like that. If I had a chance, we'd stab each other in the back. Even people that love me, I hate it. People try to help me in school. I let my heart go real long, way down here. One of my teachers seen it. Oh, man, in that room, you know, I was like, she's crazy. I hated everybody. I ain't hated myself. I bought a motorcycle. I drive, I drive a Honda one day. I drive the MG the next day. They turn. At this time, my, me and my girlfriend started going together. All these years, 15, 16, 17, so I was 18, there's something empty on the inside. I remember sometimes I just think, well, what do I want to do in life? Why don't I want to go to college? Why don't I want to get married? No. Why don't I want to do this? No. Why don't I want to do that? It's just, I'm lost. You can't describe it any other way, but lost. Like you're on the road, you don't know which way to go. You're lost. You know that's why kids stay on drugs and get high every day? Because they can't hack reality, brother. It's hard to face. They don't know which way to go. They don't know what they want to do. They're afraid they're going to get their head blew off in a war. They didn't start, you know, get drafted. And they're, they're just saying, well, I just forget the whole mess and stay high all the time. That was wrong. No purpose, no direction. Don't know why the Lord go or not. This vacuum inside of me kept getting bigger. I've been out of school 11 months. It was April 1972. Little did I know the greatest thing that could ever happen to anybody was going to happen to me. 
I'm going to bring that hell a few times before I got saved. And somebody said, ain't you worried about going to hell? And I thought, bye, everybody else is going. They can stand it out again. I thought that. Well, I really did. I said, all my friends going. Everybody I know is going. If they can stand it, I can stand it. We're all going to be down there together. That's what KISS. The rock group KISS meant when they come out with the album, Hotter Than Hell. You remember the album? And it's got Hotter Than Hell over across the front. And it's got flames up here. And they're all playing their guitars in the fire. What they're saying to you is, we're all going to hell. We'll just get down there and party when we get there. And let it out. You ain't gonna party when you get to hell. You better get all that done here. Oh, I remember. That fat cube kept getting bigger. I play ball, and didn't like play ball. I tried a motorcycle, and didn't like do that. I missed my tape, and I didn't like to do that. I just got proud of everything. I'm 18 years old. You know these kids 13 and 14 now that's never tried everything they ought to try and committed all the sin? That's true, folks. These kids right now, 15 years old, in this church, you've committed every sin you can think of about it, and you've done lived a more life than some people 40 and 50 who died lived. Grow up fast these days. The only time I remember going to church, that's when I went to the guy's place drunk like kill me. Went to his church a few times. The only time I remember my teenage years going to church when my girlfriend talked me into going. Said, Well, let's come to our church Sunday. And I finally agreed to it. I got over that Sunday. So I still get this little boy up. I thought I hated church. I felt so out of place. When I walked into church, I felt like everybody in there was looking right at me. You know the feeling? It's the same feeling I'd have right now if I walked in a bar. See? Very same feeling. See, I'm home now. This is my family. My father's here. And if I walked in somebody else's house, I'd feel funny. And that's why if you're not that's why you feel funny when you church. No there. Know something? I went that Sunday morning. We in picture up and I have one of these. You've heard I have these good looking Daniel Boone coats. So had these things hanging down, all three and hanging down here. And it looks like some kind of idiot. And I wore it to church that morning. I, that, that's our style now. That back in boy, everybody thought them was tough stuff. I wore it hanging down that morning. <laughs> Said about half, halfway back there, and I just stood there like this. I, I, my, I was real self-conscious about my hair. I thought that preacher, he was looking at me. But it all, he did not have one hair on his head. He slick and bald. Little old bitty short and thin. He's slick, brother. I said, uh-oh, uh-oh. He's looking at me. And I felt, it bothered me. I, I felt guilty. Sure enough, that service is over. And I, said, I didn't feel one thing. I, I didn't even think. I don't even know what I thought about God the whole time I was in there. You see, folks, we Christians need to learn a lesson. It's not enough just to get lost in it. The Bible said in Luke that the power of the Lord was present to heal. People can go to church all their life, but if the power of God is not there, they'll never even feel God. They will not. It's got to be God. It's got to be supernatural. It's got to be something about man's power. It's got to be something that man can't do. A few months later, a few months later, had a revival at Negro Baptist Church. It, it was it was clean up week this week. Glory to God. It's clean up week. It was clean up week. I thought we might join this thing we're doing around town. I, I thought of a good thing put on our sign out here. Keep Mary clean. Swallow your beer cans. I don't know if we do that. Uh, we might not all do that. That'd be a good one, wouldn't it? Anyway, it's clean up week. I'm going to recount you for days. Saturday, had the car, had the top down. Beautiful day, just like today. I was riding around in the car. I was riding up and down. I just ride up and down the street, right down there. Just like a nut, wasting gas, wasting tire. You know how nothing else to do. 
I was riding around that little old thing and I flew that thing to one I hadn't got killed. It really is. It's a wonder I hadn't got killed. I was going around old number 10 around the lake, man, just a flying 70, 75 miles back. Just to see how fast it goes. Long time! It's been a better car coming maybe on that side of the road or man, I'd have been gone just like this. And the emptiness was still there. The only satisfaction I got was just impressing my friends. Looking tough in front of them. Look at boy. Look how fast I go. And I got a little good feeling from that. That's all I had. That's all I had in life. What a lie. If all you got in this world is trying to fulfill your own desires and your own dreams, and you ain't never what you ain't never found out what it's like to live for Jesus and live for others and try to help other people, you don't know what living is. I mean you just missed the whole thing. You missed it all. You just lived for yourself. And I was. Well, lo and behold, on Saturday, people in here, up and down Highway 70, picking up Christ, picking up Christ, picking up Christ, picking up Christ. And I flew up by and I stopped beside someone and they said, What the hell is I said, Ah, hey, we got a lot we need to do. Boom, and took off. Now, who crazy nuts out there working? Well, I didn't do my job to clean up the trash in this city. Let somebody else do it. Now, I remember thinking like this. I was down at the schoolhouse playing ball the next season on Sunday evening. That would have been, I think, about the 14th of April, 15th. And strange looking bunch of people coming down there. Something about it. Well, you know about it, you know, just people you didn't know. Thought, Who in the world was that? Somebody said, all right, some church group. They came down there and they was on the swings, you know, walking around some college kids who it was. They from Appalachia. And boom. It was a group called POW. And that P-O-W, it stood for something, I don't know what it was, but anyway, that's what it was. And they came down to help him out with the weekend revival at Nebo Baptist Church, and Joe Parson came to preach. I don't know who Joe Parson or Pal Aiden was. My cousin, Jackie, that's the sister in the house, the sister, Jackie, worked in the store. Keller store in Nebo now. I'm blowing that store. Yep, that story had it built. And my cousin worked there and we went in. She said, Well, hey, Danny, me and my cousin, and some of the boys went there. I said, Y'all gonna come to our revival? I said, Nah, we might. And I never had no intention, never, I never had the slightest intention of going. I mean, it never crossed my mind. I said, Yeah, my. We went in there the next day on Monday. She said, now you boys are going to come to our revival one night. It's really going to be good. You boys are to I said, we might still have no intention to come whatsoever. That night I went over to my girlfriend's house. I went over the next morning morning, sometime I talked to her Monday night Tuesday. You know what done it? She said, guess what? And she named one of my friends and said, so-and-so got saved last night. Oh, she said that. Oh, wait, whoa. There's a boy I played ball with all the time. She said he got saved. I didn't know what get saved meant. I, I knew it was something you done. I knew brother it done something to you. I mean I, I mean I knew it something. Inside of me something said, uh oh, he ain't gonna cuss no more. I, I mean I thought like that, you know. I didn't know what to say. Well, I knew it was something religious. And I knew it more than just going in church, too. I know it was something, something. I know it. Boy, that put a little curiosity inside of me. And other people was going. That evening, I got I to hurry this, get to the other part. I got out there that, and brother, I, I uh, told my cousin, I said, let's go out there and see what's going on. We was at school. We was playing ball. It was about 15 or 7. Or maybe 15, I think maybe started at 7.30. I don't know. About 15 after 7. He said, all right, let's go. We, we shot a few more baskets and fooled around there a little bit, wiped sweat off of us, and got in the car, and we rode out to the church, and I said, let's go in. And we got up there, and it was 7.30, and when we looked in, everybody was all standing at the scene. And I said, I ain't going in now. They done started. People stand at us. And all that thing, I said, let's go. And we looked in the back window of the church, and then turned around and got in my car and left. I said, well, come back tomorrow night. You know, as I think about it now, 
I was under conviction and I didn't, I didn't know what it was. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, when, when God's a theory with you, it's like, it's like, you know there ain't something right like it's supposed to be. And you know something ain't right somewhere, but you just don't really know what you're looking for. And if somebody says, how about trying the Lord? You say, no, oh, that ain't it. But really, what is it? That is what you're looking for. I was under conviction. I didn't know what it was like. I, I've never been under conviction before. The Holy Ghost was a mountain. Oh, baby. All them years, boy, I thought about, I thought about him being out there somewhere. All them years, I thought about it, and the, but the wind blew where it listed through me, but I ain't kidding you. It did. And boy, it began to get all them people, boy, and it began to convict, and convict, and convict. I say this morning, boy, something got a hold of me, and I want to go, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. I still had no intention to get saved. I said, I, I, I ain't doing nothing. I'm just going to go. Dangerous way to do, you know. Next evening, Wednesday evening, April the 19th. It'll be Thursday this week, April 19th, 1972. I went over and picked her up. Pick my cousin, you have to squeeze them. I am Somebody had to sit on the gear, you know, the emergency brake. Well, looking around, got that. There's a bunch of my other friends. What are you doing here? They look at me, what are you doing here? Hey, Captain, what's he doing here tonight? Look at that. And I, I didn't know then, but I wouldn't know that there's some girls that there. He's a weak consider. I didn't know that then, but they brought the claim from me. Well, I was really got on power, you know, in this night revival that broke out on Sunday morning. It's Wednesday night. That night, I remember that group got up and started singing. I don't know how they got up. I don't mean call. Anyway, there's a bunch of college kids from Boone got up here and they stood around and they started singing. Next thing I know, everybody's standing up. Big crowd and they started singing. I don't know how they got up. I don't mean call. Anyway, there's a bunch of college kids from Boone got up here and they stood around and they started singing. Next thing I know, everybody's standing up. Big crowd of people. I I an altar. Somebody come over there. Somebody would come over there. Somebody would come over here. There's people praying, crying. I mean, I had never seen them like that. Never. I'd seen them preachers get red in the face. I'd seen them singers shout, but I'd never seen nobody cry and get down here and just bawl and ask God to forgive them. When they started out, I started getting nervous. I said, what am I doing here? I kept, you and that night, I had on a pair of blues. That's when everybody wore bell bottom blues. They're out there. Back then, the wider at the bottom, the better they <laughs> Oh, that was stupid now, but that's where they, now they're skinny, you know. The reason they change those styles so they can keep getting your money. See, if they have the same same style all the time, you wouldn't buy as many new clothes. So they change the styles, they put them in skinny, they'll go back out pretty soon. The dress is going to come up. Then when they get your money, they're going to go back down. They keep the style changing so you'll keep buying stuff and keep your money. But anyway, I, I am on some, you know, and I beat it all. I have American flag sewed on my pants right here. I would have been shot. I would have been kicked. I would have been beat for that. And you might not come in here. Well, you can come, but I ain't gonna like it if I see a flag so on your britches. I them hippies out there in California wore a flag on the seat of their pants before they wore them out. Shout on the American flag. When I see that now, boy, I want to have a flag raising. Don't you? But I know no better than I thought that America ain't no better than nowhere else. I, America, you better be thankful for this country. You could be in Russia this morning, brother, or China somewhere, where you locked up in a cell, or not not being taught there's no God, and just being herded up like cows. If you believe, don't, don't believe it when they say about let's go back to the USSR. Let them go back. I stand here. Well, I stood out that night. Flag, had on a white knit shirt, sunburnt face. Stood there. All of a sudden, this girl sitting right over here in front of me turned around and said, Hey, 
Why don't you, why don't you go up there and get saved? Boy, it made me mad. I said, it ain't my time. I know what to say. I really didn't. I didn't know what to say. I said, it ain't my time. And it made me mad. I said, well, who are you trying to tell me what I said? I oh, it's high out the hell inside. I had something in eyes of hatred. I wanted peace. I wanted happiness. But I was too proud and too stubborn to admit that I needed it. I'm too proud. I said, I ain't going down there and getting on my knees in front of all these people. Who you, you crazy? Not my time. I was one of these people that thought when it was your time to get saved, that lightning, you lightning and flash, angels playing on hearts, you know, somebody speak your your name, you know, drag you up there. No, no, God wasn't in the fire. God wasn't in the wind. God spoke by a still, small voice. Amen. Something knocked at my heart and said, Daddy, you want to let me in? I didn't know it. But it's that same God Mama talked me about when I was little. Boy to God, he, he's still there this morning. It was that same God that I heard about in church late in the pews. It was that same God that waited for me. During my teenage years, while I was out cussing and running around, getting in trouble and breaking the law. It was that same God that waited and waited and waited and waited. And finally had me in church and said, Can I come in? I was getting fidgety. I was standing there like this. And another turned and said, Danny, don't you think you ought to go? I said, it's not my time yet. And my cousin beat it off. I got punched him in the nose. He turned around and said, hey, man, let's go get saved. I said, no, no, I, you go on. I ain't going. And so he didn't go. He stood there. He stood there a few more minutes. Boy, that got me to think. I thought, well, if I don't get saved, he don't get saved. You never know how many people you're going to keep from getting saved. You don't go to hell by yourself. If you go to hell, there'll be somebody right on top of you that you're out there. Boy, a few minutes it got worse, and it got worse, and it got worse. And I think, I ain't going, I ain't going, I ain't going, I ain't going down there. This is silly. It's, I'll be all there with a few minutes, and, and we'll be going home, and, you know, and I, I'm not, I'm, I didn't, nobody in my school had ever seen me cry. That I know of, maybe when we lost a ball game or something like that, and us boys act like a bunch of little nuts, but as far as this man never be crying over what I was, and how, how sorry I I'd die before I let him see me today. Just one more moment. And I'll tell you, you won't let me come. He's knocking at somebody's heart here this morning, and you won't let him in. A few minutes. Let's go. When I said let's go, he went. I went. She went. All I had to do was I stuck that one foot out. Bitch. That doesn't win. That doesn't win. Here I come. I fell down about right here, flat on my face. Didn't just get down on my knee, just flat, just sprawled out, boy. Kind of dying. And all of a sudden I begin to cry. One of the tears just start running, 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 running out of my eyes. And it's coming so fast I couldn't stop it. And all my whole life flashed in front of my mind in a split chair. And all the times I could have been killed. And all the times that God had waited on me. I cast him and I went up to the devil and played his music. And sang his song and, and listened to his music and, and loved his music. And God was about to have mercy on me. And boy, I poured it all out. It's like I just threw it all up. All that old hatred. All that old all that emptiness, all that old bitterness, all that stuff in the inside of the black, and more how it came, and it just went away, and I didn't see it then. That morning, brother, I tell you, I can tell you the time, I can tell you the place, but the Lord saved me, but that's wonderful place. I cannot tell you how, but I cannot tell you why, but you tell me all about it. And the by and by. Somebody come around and read me some scripture and said, You believe I'm in there? I didn't even know what it said. Listen, so don't listen to these people that say, You have to then you have to read the Roman Road. Listen, man, tears are a language God understands. God knows when a sinner comes to him. It don't make no difference. Now, I, now don't get me wrong. I know you gotta trust Christ, you gotta trust him and him only, and your only hope for home in heaven. I tell people that all the time. But listen, brother, let me tell you something this morning. It's your heart attitude. 
makes a difference. God saved you or not. You can come up here and say, I believe in Christ died for my sin according to Scripture. I believe in all that stuff and still die in the head. It's a condition of your heart. That's why a lot of people come to God. And then they have to go again. And they go again. The heart ain't in the right shape. Your heart never gets in the right shape, brother. You can then get a grin and laugh and a popping bubble gum and laugh at each other and cut up. You'll be so broken up, brother. You'll be so scared. You'll be so... You won't know there's anybody else in the church. You don't care who sees you. You say, I've got to get by. I've got to get this heavy burden off my shape. That night, sure enough, about 45 minutes later, I got up. I didn't take more than 45 minutes to say me. This took me 45 minutes. I believe he did. The Lord saved you in a split second. The minute you trust Christ as your Savior, He does it. But then you're just getting in a hurry when something like that gets happening to you. I mean, it's only going to happen one time. Well, it's like marriage, man. Make the best out of it. Boy, now, I got up here by the hug. I didn't know what to do. I just hugged her neck back. I've never done that before, but it felt good. I liked it. And I didn't go back there and sit down where I was. I sat down right there on the front feet. I mean, I sat right down there on the front. I'm going to start out right. That night, that preacher, old Joe Parson guy, but me, he's an old prophet of God, brother. I didn't know who he was. He got up and looked right down at me. There's a bunch of people sitting around there. He looked right at me and said, You get everybody in the cell, son. I didn't know if I did or not. I, I guess I had. I don't know what he's talking about, but I said, yes, sir, sure did. I don't know why. To this day, I don't know why he done that, but he did. Boy, I'll tell you what. Things begin to change. That night, I know I've got to hurry, folks. Y'all get through before I do. You can leave. I've never done this before. I just want to enjoy it. He probably is part of a horrible pit. He probably is so long in my mouth. I tell you why I used to listen to Graham Funk Railroad, and then I started listening to the inspiration. I didn't know these guys. I used to listen to Alice Cooper, and then all of a sudden, there's a land that is tired and they I started sounding good. I said, man, I must have got saved. I used to couldn't stand to hear that stuff, and I like it, I like it. I can't go in this car, and I enjoy it. That's a truth. Oh, I got up there that night and make a long story short. Some guy got me right after the service and he put his arm around me and said, Boy, I'm proud of you, son. He said, You're going to be a preacher. <laughs> I said, What you think? You've got me in church. It's far as I'm going. I ain't never going to be no preacher. I never thought about being a preacher. I, I ain't never, it never crossed my mind to be a preacher. You know, a lot of times you hear boys talk about when they're little, getting out on the stump, you know, acting like they're preaching. Everything. I never remember doing that like that. Never, never even considered it. Many, many blessings began to come. Prayers were answered. Wasn't long. When I first got saved, I don't know if I had as much patience with me as my pastor did with us. Most churches, the reason God can't save a bunch of people in them because the Christian just couldn't handle it. If there's a hundred new young teenagers coming to the average church and got saved, that church would go all to pieces. They couldn't have it. Listen, brother, we I've come to the church. We all they had you'd have a bunch of old long hair boys sitting right across the front. The invitation, every one of them hit all of them say. Some of those older folks, I mean, they were real good. I, I look back now and I they've done an amazing job. They're probably more patient than I would have been. They look like what's our church crazy? This fanaticism, this emotionalism, this all this uh, shouting and this uh, uh, crying, all these things we're not used to it. And we, I wore shorts. I wore shorts to church and sung the choir. Sure did. Sure did, brother. I went, stood right up here on the back seat, wore short football jersey, I cut off blue jeans. Now, now I ain't gonna stand for that. Thank God for my pastor. He's a man that loves me. But I, I ain't going to stand for that. You ain't going to do that, do you? <laughs> I love you and everything, but you ain't going to do it. I mean, I just don't know if I can stand that. I'm not one time. 
But we did. And thank God for a pastor. He knew it all. He's seen something. He's seen God's done the work. He said, I'm going back up that yellow. You know, I, I've been in churches where the preacher got up and just hurt new converts. A sense that they didn't know anything about. I'll tell you something, brother. If God gets in somebody, he'll pick clean up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guarantee you, man. I mean, it's, I really love me, preacher. I preach it myself. But, brother, if God gets in somebody, if they get that inside clean, it ain't going to be long that outside going to be clean. Yeah. Well, the Lord began to deal with me, and I... I see all of them on the side of the church and parts of that side. I'll take off after service, you know, and scaring them old people and everything. We shouldn't have done that. And Lord was good to me. And then I began to read the Bible. The next day after I got saved, I went to work and got fired. The very next day. I told you a little bit about Wednesday night. I went to work the next day. Me and this black guy I work with, he's selling marijuana. He wanted me to help him sell us. I ain't messing with that stuff. He gets some of it and uh, water it up and put about half straws out of a broom in it, you know. Make it go farther. That's where just rip people off and make them think they're getting the real stuff. And he had all kinds of jokes. And ain't no telling. Right at the back of weeds and broom sage and everything. I'm no telling what he had in there. And he said it was pop. Anyway, he'd telling people that. And he's trying to get me there. And the Lord got me out of there. I went home the night after I got saved. I think Mom was doing the dishes. She's in the kitchen. I don't know not to ask her. She's sitting over there. As soon as I went to the door, something said, tell her. I said, I'm not kidding at all. Something said, tell her. I've never been to a soul winning course. Never, nobody never told me you're supposed to witness with your lips. But just something inside said, tell her. I said, Mom, guess where I'm at? She said, where? I said, church. She said, well, good, son. She's probably surprised. And I started going to bed and I said, tell her. Oh, I when I said that, Lord just like turned the bar of honey over his, inside of me. You wouldn't believe it. I just want to go. Wah! I didn't, but I want to. Now I just go ahead and do it. Don't care. I remember we got fired and they gave me a few months off. I had my money. I got out of the bank. I sat and read the Bible all the time. One day I read 130 something chapters of the Bible. I just read it, read it. I didn't understand it. I just read it. The Lord didn't say understand it. He said read it. Seek you out the book of the Lord and read. Boy, I got in this book and I began to read. And I read for all three hours. My eyes would be burning. I'd go get me something to eat. And I'd come back home and I'd read some more. And I'd read some more. And I'd read some more. And about three months of that, brother, I was a new person. The old daddy passed away and all things became new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to know it felt like fire inside uh, it felt like fire inside of my chest. It just wow, wow. It was devouring everything. I mean that's all I could think about. And God began to answer prayers. One time I was at home praying. The Lord the Lord can do certain things to help a new convert know that he's with them. He don't do it after you've been saved for a while all the time. But when you first get saved, God does a bunch of little special things for you. Just to let you know that it's real and He's with you. Well, I've never been the same since that. I'm going to tell you something this morning. I'm going to hush for a minute. A lot of water has gone under the bridge in the past 12 years. I've been so discouraged. I've been hurt. I've been happy. And I'll tell you something this morning. I want to go on record. I have never, at my lowest hour in my Christian life, have I ever felt that same emptiness that I did before I got saved. Amen. Go. 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 Somebody's in here. Somebody's inside the heart. He's there. He's there. He's there. I mean, that old emptiness is gone. You ask me why I'm happy? So I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. Amen. I've had more fun since I've been saved than I did all my life before I got saved. I mean, I'm having a ball. Really, I have a good time. You know what some of you people think? You think, oh boy, it sure must be a boring life, that Christian thing. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do everything's a sin. You can't do this. Listen, brother, I've had more fun since I've been saved than I ever did before I got saved. Amen. 
We went down there last night and took the youth choir, man, we had a ball. We sung all the way down there and back. There's about 80 of us went last night. I mean, we had the bus back full, about four or five cars, and I think it was right at close to 80. And we had a ball. We sung all the way back, man. We went to Hardy's Bar, and we cut up, boy, and we had fellowship. We listened to preaching. We prayed. We shouted. We just had a wonderful time. I didn't have a hangover this morning. The law wasn't looking for me. I ain't know I was hacking for it. Still here, here, ready to do it again this morning. Lord willing, I'll be back and have another good time tonight. And I'll start tomorrow night in the Bible. The next night, the next night, Thursday, I'll be saved 12 years. You say, what's he done? Well, glory to God, I'll be in heaven. And I'll be one. Well, I'll have my just turn flip, you know. Shouting, brother, and fellowship with the Lord. And things hang around the throne. And one day, his face I'll see. And boy, if I die, if I die, and y'all have to have me a funeral, I ain't expecting to. But if I do, if I die, I want the choir to sing. It is well, it is well with my soul. There's one thing I don't know. There's a lot I don't know this morning. A lot I don't know. A lot I don't understand. There's one thing I know this morning, brother. It is well. It is well with my soul. If I'm trying to say I go to hell, the old account was said a long ago. And the record clearly, for he wants my sin away. You know, like some people marry and think something crazy. Hey. Boy, I don't anybody think it. But they ain't got no more money. I think they are. Yeah. I've had the time of my life. I wonder this morning if somebody's sitting there saying, that's never happened to me. It's never happened to me. Let me report to you this morning. That same thing can happen to you this morning. God don't do everybody the same way. You may not succeed or feel or experience anything or anything like that, but the Lord can do the same thing for you as He's done for me. You can be saved this morning. Let's stand with our heads back.